Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is November the 10th in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, speaking of November the 10th, we are a third of the way through the month. And what that means is if you are reading five chapters of the New Testament each day, you are a third of the way through the New Testament, which if you're new to us means if you read five chapters of the New Testament each day, you will read the New Testament every single month, 12 times a year, 60 times in five years. Now, I myself have read through the book of Hebrews, through the book of Romans, and I'm halfway through the book of John. And so what you may notice by that is that when I first started reading through the New Testament each month, I read Matthew to Revelation. But to spice it up, I started changing the order in which I read. Now, I think it's important that early on you read the four Gospels in succession, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so you get a full picture of of the story of Jesus. But after some time, you're going to want to mix it up a little. So you may start with the book of Revelation. You may start with the letters of Paul. But keep it fresh and exciting because truly that's what the word of life is meant to be. Fresh and exciting to us. A new experience each time that we read it. Well, that being said, we're continuing our study in the book of Hebrews today. And as I stated, we're going to dissect this very closely. And so we're not in any rush to push our way or force our way through the book. And so let us begin this morning by reading the first three verses, because the picture is the Lord Jesus. He is high and exalted. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is king of all kings. Lord of all lords, all creation bows before him, worships and adore him because it is all about him, hallelujah. And that's what these first three verses remind us of. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the Father by the prophets, he has spoken to us through many different people, through many different ways, and at many different times. But in these last days, he has spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory. Take a moment and focus on those words, friend. Jesus is the brightness of the glory of the Almighty. He is the express image of his person. He upholds all things by the word of his power. He himself has purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now we're going to look very closely at these three verses over the course of the next several days. But I want us to feel the full implication of what this letter is. And so in order to do that, we must picture ourselves back in the days of Jesus, sitting in a small village, dirt floors, no electricity, no running water, under the oppression of Rome, and holding very dear to our customs and our tradition, our culture as Jewish people, as the people of God. And yet this man, Jesus, has arrived on the scene and through proclamation of many miracles and supernatural events, which cannot be denied is unlike any person who has walked the face of the earth. And so there is something special about him. And yet his message is different from that of what the Jewish people have always held dear to. And so for those Jews who have heeded this message of Jesus, they have lost family members. They have lost friends. They have been kicked out of the temple by the Jewish leaders. And so they are huddled together in a small corner of a small home, striving desperately to follow the teachings of Jesus, but feeling the heartache that comes with being a follower of Jesus. 
And so as this letter arrives, it reminds them of who Jesus is, that the price that they are paying is worthy of the calling. And just as he suffered, so shall they suffer. You see, you have to remember that through the teachings of Moses, who was their greatest prophet up until this point, he who brought the law from God told them in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 39, know therefore this day and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, Yahweh, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. And yet Jesus proclaims to be God. Now they are familiar with the Jewish scriptures, so they know that in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it tells them, unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So this baby will be called the mighty God, the everlasting father. It says in verse seven of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So aligning him in the position of government, he is to be a ruler and upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth, even forever. So as familiar as they are with the scriptures, They are looking for a king that will rid them once and for all from oppression. Yet for some reason, they omitted Isaiah chapter 53, which says the Messiah has no form nor comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Verse 7, he was oppressed. He was afflicted. Verse 9, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Verse 12, he was numbered with the transgressors. Now, friends, this doesn't sound like a ruler. This doesn't sound like a king. And yet they are being told in the book of Hebrews that he has been appointed heir of all things. He made the worlds. He is the brightness of the glory of Yahweh. He is the express image of Yahweh. He upholds all things by the word of his power. And he has sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. You see, Jesus is the end of all things. He is the heir. Jesus is the beginning of all things. He is the creator. And Jesus is the middle of all things. He is the sustainer and the purifier. And that's why he says of himself, he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, and everything in between. All of eternity past is about Jesus. All of the time that we live in is about Jesus. And all of eternity future is about Jesus. That's why we are told by the Holy Spirit through the person of Paul in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9, God has highly exalted him, has given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so as we end our time together today, we must ask ourselves the question, friends, who is Jesus to us? Do we see him as eternal God? Do we see him as a mere prophet? Do we see him as a great man? Because until we can answer that question properly, our journey is at a standstill. John MacArthur says it like this, When the question is brought up as to who Jesus Christ really was, some people will say he was a good teacher. Some will say he was a religious fanatic. Some will say he was a fake. And some will claim he was a criminal, a phantom, or a political revolutionary. Others are likely to believe that he was the highest form of humankind, who had a spark of divinity which he fanned in the flame. A spark, they claim, that all of us have 
but seldom fan. And when we see this spark in people, we would recognize them as people like Gandhi, people like Buddha. And so these people would say throughout time, we have seen these individuals who have tapped into something that we miss. And Jesus was simply one of those people. There are countless human explanations as to who Jesus was. But the Bible tells us in Hebrews verses 2 and 3 that Jesus is seen in a sevenfold presentation and in all these excellencies, he is clearly much more than a man. That's why 1 John chapter 4 verse 2 says, Hereby we know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. This isn't stating that we should recognize that he was born on earth, but that Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah, is almighty God, Yahweh himself, in the flesh. And that is why our text says, he is the brightness of the glory of God. He is the express image of his person. And so friends, as we look at the person of Jesus, as we seek to see him in his eternal glory, we must see him in his humanity, smitten and stricken and bearing our sins, and we must see him in his divinity, the author and finisher of our faith, the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, worthy of all of our adoration, all of our praise, all of our worship, all of our allegiance, and all of our obedience. And so I trust today, friend, that as you seek to serve him in your life, that you will bring honor unto his name and glory to his father. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so grateful that you're again with us today. I pray that you're anticipating great things through this study in the book of Hebrews. And I pray that you're a little bit more like our Lord Jesus today than you were yesterday. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I love you, and I'll see you on the next video.